We'll start the questions now with Lawrence E. Spivak, permanent member of the Meet the Press panel. Uh, Mr. Wilkins, there are a great many people, as I'm sure you know, who believe that it'd be impossible to bring more than 100,000 militant Negroes into Washington without incidents and possibly riot. What do you see as the effect on the just cause of the Negro if you do have any incidents, if you do have any rioting? That was the attitude, militant. And, and those folks are not militant at all. They were, they were working class, middle class folks who wouldn't lift a rock. But uh, that was a, a message that was sent out, yeah. The reason why I went, um, uh, my paper is very conservative, my, the Cleveland Press, conservative in the sense that, you know, it served a blue collar uh, readership, uh, white and black. And, uh, and they were very dubious about this march on Washington. And Louis Clifford, the, uh, the editor, the city editor, uh, Louis Clifford, C-L-I-F-F-O-R-D, says, Ernie, he, said, no, he, he didn't say it. he didn't say that. He said, let somebody, let's send somebody there on this bus. There were actually three buses, but he's, he said, let's send it on, on this bus, he said, just to see what happens. He says, my guess is in a good there, there's going to be a riot. It's going to take place. There's going to be a lot of heads cracked there. He said, we want to be there and see that, says he. Uh, and, and they said, well, who can we send? Uh, and my, my uh, partner, we, we were a two-person department that covered so-called community news. He said, well, he says, uh, Ernie, would you like to go? I said, yeah. He said, what? They said, Let, let's send Ernie to go. And he said, um, okay. He said they didn't want to send an important reporter there in case all of this, <laughs> this trouble broke out. They didn't want anybody important to get hurt. So, so they said, they sent me. Uh, and uh, so that was really my purpose, was just to go and watch what happened and to cover any kind of news that broke out. But it wasn't 100,000 Negroes. As I said, there was just as many white people down there of all ages and all nationalities and all so-called Negroes aren't the same. We are different people just like white people are different people. We are Nigerians, Ghanaians, Jamaicans, uh, 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 born in America, true Americans. I think those numbers came from the Park Service. Okay. And the Park Service were white people. But they were the official voice. I suspect they were it was underestimated. And then you, you have to look with a certain carefulness at numbers that the black press might use. Okay. So I think they took a number somewhere in between uh, exaggeration on our end and deliberate underestimation on their end and just came out with 200, 250,000 people. And I do believe, well I know that the, the Afro and I I feel safe in assuming that other minority papers drummed it up. The purpose of the the, the purpose of the march, of course, uh, wh whose official name was the March on Washington for jo for March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, and that's what it was about. It was uh, uh, a demonstration to highlight the needs of the black community in getting work opportunities, and also. Uh, to, to support the desegregation effort that was in full flow, of course, all across the South and in parts elsewhere. Um, we had a very interesting idea. One, one of the uh, groups of people um, um, decided that it would be really cool to get some people on a, on a couple of buses and we would go by bus uh, to the march and uh, take part in it, uh, black and white. In fact, it was, I'd say about, probably about 50-50 in terms of, um, of, of the participants. The coverage represented not what happened, but what it was about. 
I, do, I don't think they anticipated the numbers. They didn't expect the. Uh, I, don't think we, I don't think we anticipated the impact because it took us all by surprise. But they, the coverage was assigned because it was that important that it be documented however it went to whatever level with the people involved and the and the entertainment provided uh, the speakers knew ahead of time it couldn't it couldn't be but so it had to be at a best level we could produce not what turned out but you had to anticipate that it was going to be historical the people, the whites who came to the march, were the were the whites who were supportive of civil rights at the time. They they were all uh, these were the folks who who um, believed in in the cause. It kind of stays in your mind because um, they carried placards made by the union. <laughs> well, so it was jobs justice and peace that's what they and when they repeated it you know they had subsequent marches what 20 years later and they had one 30 years later uh, they still said jobs justice peace I think the one at the 30 year point also added passing the torch to the next generation that was 30 years after 1963 but it it started out the struggle, but specifics with jobs, justice, and peace. The UAW had this thing where, we, where every week the workers would be brought together and they'd talk about current events, especially events that, bore, that, that could bear on their, on, the, on their lives, you know, uh, social change, uh, uh, civil rights developments, and so on. And, the, and UAW took a very progressive attitude toward these things, which had a remarkable effect. The, working, the workforce in Cleveland was a mix of blacks as well as, as, as lower income white people, many of them for, from Appalachia. But the, the work of the UAW was such that all of these people really came by and got along very well and, and worked together for social causes, including including civil rights. But the real force, forces behind the march uh, were uh, Bayard Rustin, who did the day-to-day -day work, a brilliant organizer, and, and his mentor, A. Philip Randolph, who was, who was president and organizer, who was president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Um, they were the prime movers. Uh, in fact, Randolph had to talk the big six, five leaders, NAA, Urban League, Corps, et cetera, into, into uh, agreeing on a march. He had proposed one in the 40s that had, uh, he called it off after he had made an agreement with President Roosevelt. Um, and so he called off the march in the 40s, but he did realize his Dream March in 1963, but and and besides them had a lot of well each organization had workers put it together. The other groups, leaders, SNCC, Core, mm -hmm. um, the unions, mm -hmm. they knew what they were doing. Nobody can do it, organize a mean de demonstration like the Teamsters, <laughs> you know. So the organizers were over hat. The papers. Part of what any uh, minority paper's job ought to be is to fan the fire. If there's a protest, inform people, take a side. You know, stand for something and and mobilize people. That's what the, what you're there for. That's why I'm saying if you take that attitude to a minority paper, you'll do the same thing there. You just have to do it a different way. So the papers. Definitely, uh, ours did, and we were in ten different sites, eight different cities, supported the march, but cautioned uh, 
good behavior. I don't think we ever use that word, dignity. And uh, remember the cause. And take a take us take a book from from the nonviolence side of it, even if provoked. Take a little something to make the point. It took a, took a lot of work to get all those buses organized. Uh, those, uh, those huge numbers to come from across the country and gather in D.C. on a specific day, a specific time. So there were a lot of work done by people, um, uh, say, uh, you know, working uh, 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 on the line. And, uh, so we, we rode the bus overnight, got there in, in the morning of the first day, and, uh, and found, of course, there was no riot going on. What, what really happened in Washington, first of all, Washington was really not the kind of place to have a riot over this. There were a lot of Southerners there, to, for sure. But there were Southerners there were in federal employee, and they weren't the kind of people who would ruin their reputations fighting people. So people who were against it left town for the weekend. Uh, and so only people left were friends. Um, and so we uh, uh, got off the bus got maybe like an hour of sleep <laughs> and we got back out on the street and took part in in, in the activities. Uh, so people were walking from New York, New Jersey, and uh, Philadelphia. Uh, they walked for a day and camped for a day. And they was coming from all directions in the United States walking. And uh, they really want to be in when they have the march on Washington. And I applaud them for walking the distance they walk. And the number of people who showed up was amazing to me at that time. To see such a large amount of people, well-dressed and orderly, And what police expected probably was a mob. There were policemen lying in the streets, all over the place, as if riders were on the way. But this was such an amazing gathering of people who were very orderly and I say wonderful. Uh, it was like a wonderland. I mean there was you know just wall-to-wall -wall people all up and down the, the mall uh, and the side streets and so on and so we, we for the most part stayed together and uh, and just communed with what with our amongst ourselves met other people uh, met uh, leaders and um, and, wa and watched the march and witnessed uh, of course the great speeches uh, and occurrences Mahalia singing uh, and uh, all the all of the various speeches that took place uh, I was just a local just a local reporter looking watching my people seeing what they do and seeing how they were taking this in and how they're, react, how they're reacting to it. And then, of course, blown away by the speeches, which were unanticipated. No, I mean, who knew, you know, all this stuff was going on. Um, and uh, I think indirectly, it really gave me a, an appreciation for, 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 for the movement, for the serious, the great variety of very serious people that were involved in this. Uh, for politics at a level that I never really thought before. Um, and it sort of indirectly made me a better journalist uh, going forward, you know. I moved around quite a lot, walked all over the place to make sure everybody was in place and we were covering all the different areas. And that includes the uh, place where people were speaking, where the program was, 
plus individual gathering, grouping, scattered around everywhere. And VIP is the very important people who were also mixed in the crowd. So there was a constant movement. It wasn't just sitting and watching a program. It was getting involved in the mob and trying to get a story, interviewing people, talking to people, looking around for new ideas. Out of the crowd, my hand Jackson said, after he had given a speech, Martin, give the I Have a Dream speech. Give the I Have a Dream speech. So Martin Luther King started in that speech. And it stirred up the crowd. So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Well, I think people were playing it by ear. Uh, to tell the truth, um, even though there were a lot of very impressive speeches there that day, I think the King speech was so inspirational that it really stopped uh, people in, in, the, in the newsrooms and they said, "My goodness, you know, this uh, this could be a turning point." You know. Just as I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Uh, his dream was that we, that, that we would have a level of integration. Uh, his dream was that we would have opportunities uh, f for blacks and, and, and minorities to, to uh, fulfill their dreams. Well, I would say that I was regarded as the place that Dr. King made his mark. He came there as a prominent minister from Alabama, and he left there one of the six leaders of our people on the forward march. The King's speech touched people, including people who had, who had, who had uh, theretofore been indifferent toward it. Uh, many blacks, uh, northern blacks, who saw that as, as kind of a southern thing going on down there, uh, many of them not uh, um, uh, terribly hopeful it was going to turn out, turn out to advantage. A lot of, a, a, a lot of, of the effect of that march made people more, raise their expectations about things. We should know that, first of all, that was not the, the main purpose of the speech. That was a great speech. I mean, it's gone down as one of the uh, greatest in, 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 in American history, along with the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the speech was a speech, a great speech. But the purpose uh, of the of the event itself has been really lost because of that speech. The purpose of jobs, justice, equality uh, got totally lost because uh, we, the media, picked up uh, on the speech itself. It's painful to one use one or two paragraphs out of that speech and let that be the speech, let that be the event. It's painful to, to, to teach the speech to kids and they recite all of it and all of the inflections are wrong. 
the emphasis on, it means nothing to them so my thing would be to have young people slow up long enough if you're going to hear it at all if you're going to deal with it at all deal with it there are pieces in that speech that are more important than what we generally hear it impacted at every single imaginable level you know including Lyndon Johnson of course uh, 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 President Kennedy had said that had, had, had uh, endorsed uh, programs to to achieve uh, racial equality and so on, but it was Lyndon Johnson who actually did it. We must not approach the observance and enforcement of this law in a vengeful spirit. Its purpose is not to punish. Its purpose is not to divide, but to end divisions, divisions which have lasted all too long. Its purpose is national, not regional. This Civil Rights Act is a challenge to all of us to go to work in our communities and our states, in our homes and in our hearts, to eliminate the last vestiges of injustice in our beloved country. So tonight I urge every public official, every religious leader, every business and professional man, every working man, every housewife, I urge every American to join in this effort to bring justice and hope to all our people and to bring peace to our land. He used, he, he, he used the momentum uh, created by the march as well, of course, as by the assassination uh, to fuel uh, uh, activity uh, on the Hill, on Capitol Hill, to move toward addressing civil rights grievances. And it, and it happened so fast. I mean, all of these dramatic things happened in 1968 when only the, the, yes, uh, uh, the, year, the year after that, um, I mean, it, it had, the, the events happened in, in, in 1963. A year after that, 1964, he had mobilized Congress uh, to draw up a civil rights uh, bill. The Civil Rights uh, Act and the Voting Rights Act, all within the year after that, were, were enacted by, by Johnson. Mark showed us the, the benefits and the necessity for on unity, and that's what it taught us. And it also taught us how the importance of, of, of simplifying your goal. Right now, we have drifted back into racism is the problem, too large. March taught us, okay, you got to figure out how to articulate that in a piece small enough for small groups, individuals, movements to get their head around. And then you piece it all together to the bigger struggle. I don't, he, there's no way he could imagine, <laughs> even though he gave that speech, no way that he could have imagined what's, what, what has taken place now. Because uh, so much fundamental change has taken place, you know. Changes are taking place all over the world in, 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 in response to that. I'm really shown what, what, what really can be done. Uh, I would think that Dr. King would be saying what I'm saying, namely that we really have to work, education has to become more of a priority, you know. Well, I have talked to a lot of youngsters who were born at the same time or even later, and they are very unaware. Uh, they don't recognize a lot, a lot of the names figures who were participants. Uh, I, uh, and I, I, um, I go to journalism uh, meetings and other meetings all the time and talk about uh, what happened. And I, what I try to do, because I know it's, and I, I see it happening, <clears throat> how our history has re is really getting distorted. One example, I heard a I heard a reporter 
on one of the local channels in D.C. last week uh, talking about uh, Dr. Lowry, Joseph Lowry, who later succeeded King as SLC president, saying that Lowry led the Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, Dr. Lowry did not lead, but here was this young reporter saying that. So that's the kind of thing that I try to counter, and I've heard a lot of it, uh, of, of, of uh, misinterpreting uh, uh, history. And I think the, 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 the less we talk about it ourselves and tell it like it was, the more our history will be distorted, that it eventually will make it into the history books, unfortunately. Uh, we have achieved the most unlikely thing, event, another thing that, that wouldn't happen in almost any other culture that we're aware of to have a person, a minority, be, be elected the president of the, of the country, you know. Uh, it, would, it wouldn't happen hardly, hardly anywhere else. There, there's nobody, it's not even talked about any, any, anywhere else. Uh, but it, uh, even more important than having uh, a, a Barack being president, more important than that is the fact that people from so many walks of life saw various, came to this in, in different ways. Uh, many saw him as being a very progressive person. Uh, others saw this as a chance to make a statement to the world to show that we are, you know, we really are the melting pot. We really are uh, a people who are a, a special people. Um, it, it gave, it, 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 it reworked the whole po uh, political paradigm in, in, in that sense. I think we've retrogressed. Let me give an example in, our, in, in, the, in the media. In the 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s, <coughs> the, uh, the media companies would report on their progress or lack thereof of minority hiring, non-white hiring. Today, they refuse to give you the numbers. And, uh, uh, the, uh, and social media, the new media, won't say they don't want to deal with this at all. We don't keep those numbers. They don't want to say, talk about it because they are horrible. And so I think we have really retrogressed, in, especially in the media and in a lot of other ways. To, uh, and the other thing that's happened that, that, that might bother Dr. King, of course, has been what's happened to the family unit itself, you know, since since those days, since those days, you know, dramatic change in family in, fam, in the contours of family since the 1960s, when uh, you know, you were you were born at, at the time when we still were li living on one on one one salary, uh, while mom was the was the homemaker, making sure uh, that the home was taken care of, also playing a very vital role in making sure kids did homework and and did those kinds of things. That's kind of missing here now, because mom comes in dog tired like dad, don't do that anymore. That, I mean, that's the change in, in, the, in, in, in the society, you know, uh, with consequences, you know. Uh, so uh, lots of kids who, who might have gotten more nurture and, and more push toward a, a educational achievement and so on, are missing that now. It has to come from somewhere else, you know. Uh, Teachers are busy trying to teach kids who are less and less willing to go along with it, and and parents are too tired to do a lot of things that we might have done before. Some of the myth, um, the myth that with what happened with, that the march influenced the '64 Act, the '65 Act, '68 Housing Fair Housing Act that all of those laws resolved things, that we don't have a race problem anymore. Well, that's a myth, we do have a race problem. Um, the myth that Dr. King's speech so, was so influential that it changed white minds, uh, in, fact, in, in, in effect, 
changed all of all American white minds. That is not true. Um, the myth that we're doing fine now in jobs, uh, we're well integrated, that is totally not true. Uh, so those are some of the, the things that, and also I think that led up to the myth of the post-racial, <laughs> post-society, post-racial society, that, which is obviously stupid as far as I'm concerned. I, mean, I, I don't like, I don't let those words cross my lips. Staggering backwards. in terms of clear goals, commitment to achieving change, willingness to sacrifice to achieve what's rightfully yours, but it's not, we're in a period where we have been so absorbed into life in the comfortable level of 